The following interview was conducted with Dennis Saviano, the uh, Vice Associate uh, Provost and former Dean of the School of Consumer and Family Sciences for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, September 21, 2010 in the Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Good morning. Good morning. Dean. Welcome. Thank you very much. Let's start off, uh, tell us about where you were born and your parents and early years. Oh, my parents were first generation Italian Americans. My grandparents came from Italy, migrated. Uh, actually, my, my great grand, my, my grandfather came when he was 17. And when he was in his early 20s, the family sent over his wife, who was 15. So it was an arranged marriage. They come by way, uh, through New York? Yeah, they came through Ellis Island, through okay. New York. Then through New York, uh, Youngstown, Ohio, and to Detroit. My parents met in Detroit after World War II. My father got out of the service and went to work for Packard Motor Car Company, where my mother was working, and they went to California on their honeymoon and never went back. Okay. So I'm a Californian, born and raised. My sibling, my, my brother, who's uh, since gone, and my uh, cousins and I are the first generation to go to college. Okay. And I think we all have at least bachelor's degrees. Tell us a little about degrees. grade school and high school, and then we'll move on to college. Well, Southern California uh, in the... 60s and 70s was a very booming environment. Well, still a booming environment, but it was, it was a constant growth. Uh, one would see new subdivisions, new downtowns, new roads and highways almost constantly. So I grew up expecting that growth was the norm and that for something not to grow was very unusual. And actually, after we moved to Minnesota from California in the early 80s, to live in a place that wasn't booming was, was a bit unusual. Oh, but we've been in the Midwest now 30 years. Okay. What high school did you go to? Were there any student clubs that, to participate? Upland High School. Oh. Uh, any teachers that came to mind? Well, let's see. Uh, my physics teacher was also my tennis coach. And he was, uh, uh, Mr. Troutwine was, was a wonderful teacher. Very ethical, solid, uh, hardworking, uh, made you have a good work ethic. I think I remember him the most. Uh huh. Uh, I played a lot of tennis. I, uh, my, my family owned a house just up the block from the, the high school tennis courts. I could walk to high school. And so I learned to play tennis at a young age, and that was always pleasurable. Loved math. I uh, always did well in school. My mother, who didn't know a lot about school because she only had a high school degree, knew that it was important. And uh, so I would have to do my homework before I, sure. I would uh, go out and play. and. Uh, as long as I brought home A's, she was happy. That's good. Okay. And then uh, you went to uh, college out there too, didn't you? I did. Yeah. Um, How did you happen to select Claremont? Well, Claremont was four miles from home, and I was the youngest in the family. And my Italian mother uh, really didn't want me to leave home. So I actually lived at home when I went to college. And I started a community college. And uh, that was actually a good experience. There were a number of us in the community college who were headed for a four-year degree or beyond. and. Uh, maybe 30 or 40, and so it was a nice small cohort of students sure. that I got to know. And started out in architecture. Still have a, a love of design and architecture. And, but then I took a biology course from a professor named Jim Delorier at Chafee. And Jim was just amazing. He, uh, he really brought to life how little we knew about biological systems. And the, the and lack of knowledge, background in right? It. The lack of knowledge was really intriguing to me because you could do research. And in fact, I started a, re, a research project in my sophomore year at Chafee, which I then took to Claremont and was my thesis at Claremont. So I actually did it for three years, and really fell in love with research as an undergraduate. And I think that was a, a bit a bit telling of where my life would go and sure. my future would go. And Claremont was only four miles from home as well, and wonderful institution. Uh, Challenging, great students, uh, good, good faculty. I think what I loved most about Claremont was that I got a very diverse education. I took outstanding courses in political science, in religion, in economics, but I was a biology major. So I also really had the diversified. science. You really diversified. And that, that also, I think, is telling about the future because right. you know, science helps people. Right. And sometimes we do science for science's sake, but I think when we do science with the idea that it's going to change the world, that's really where it has value. Right. And so the economics and the 
religion and the political science, I think, were very important part of my education. Well, how large was the school? And how large was your class? Is that Claremont graduated about 200 a year. I think yeah. today it graduates around 300 a year. Mm -hmm. It was a men's college then. And it's then been a long, it's a long, it's an old school. It's been around for quite a no, while. No, 46, post-World War II. After the war? Oh, okay. Pomona is the oldest. Pomona is, is in, I think, right. was founded in the 20s, perhaps. Claremont was founded just after World War II. Mm -hmm. It became co-ed, I think, about the time I graduated in 1975. Okay. And what came next then after that? Well, my mother was a health food nut. And I loved biology. And she would go and buy all these unusual things at the, at the health food store. And I worried about them because some of them could be dangerous, whereas others might actually be very healthy for you. So I started looking at what I could do with a biology undergraduate degree and thought about medicine. But did you know that there are sick people in hospitals? And those people really need passionate health care providers. And I think my, my, my psyche was such that that was a hard thing. When I did shadow doctors and work with doctors, it was very difficult. Whereas we at Purdue and in higher education, we get to work with bright, young, healthy people who are going to change the world. And that really excited me. So I went that direction. I went to graduate school in nutritional biochemistry, and I went to University of California at Davis, which was a wonderful place to go at the time. It still is a wonderful place. Mm -hmm. um, outstanding faculty. In fact, my, my advisor, Andy Clifford, is still on the faculty. He's in his mid-70s, and he's still there working and very productive. And he was uh, a very hard worker. He instilled that, that, that work ethic in all of his students. And I had a wonderful um, department head named Bill Weir. And I actually taught for Bill Weir. And then when Bill went on sabbatical, I took his courses. So as a doctoral student, I, I both had a teaching experience and a good research experience. Sure. That were both nice combination. Yeah, and they were both independent, too, mm -hmm. which set me up well to go to Minnesota on the faculty. So we loaded up my four-week-old daughter, who's now 30. Did you meet your wife at, uh, in grad school? or? In I college? met my wife at Chafee in, okay. the, in the second year in biology. Okay. Um, we've been married now 35 years. Three, three kids, two Purdue graduates and one here at Purdue. Okay. So one in Kemi, one in hospitality management, and the third now in Ag Econ. Okay. How did you happen to do the job in Minnesota come? Did, were they doing recruiting or Well, I, I, you, know, you know, as a graduate student, you look at everything. You, sure. you apply for everything you can. and. I really wanted to go to Michigan State. They had a faculty position, and Minnesota had one. And I also wanted to go to Arizona, uh, closer to home, warm weather. I'm not a big fan of winter, even after 30-some years in the Midwest. Um, but the Minnesota job was just a timely one. It was where the offer came and the opportunity came. And it, it was really a good choice because the Minnesota program was ideal for me. They have a medical school, a public health school, an ag school, strong biological sciences, a lot of interdisciplinary work. Um, so I could take advantage of the economics and the political science along with the biology. And I, I taught world food problems at Minnesota for 15 years with an economist and a sociologist and an animal scientist and a food scientist and others, which was a very interdisciplinary Nice category of people. Yeah. And then as a, an associate press professor, I took on a graduate program in, in nutrition, and it included public health faculty and uh, medicine faculty, bio biology, biochemistry faculty, and ag faculty, human, human sciences faculty. And so we really had an opportunity to build something special, and that was fun. I really enjoyed that. We took the program. Uh, we, we, we earned an NIH training grant for MD-PhDs. We had a great relationship with the Mayo Clinic. Uh, we had wonderful nutritional epidemiologists with John Potter and others over in the, mm -hmm. in the public health school. And that was, you know, I guess my first success in administration. Where I really enjoyed working with the faculty and the students. Did it still allow you to continue on with your research? Oh, it did. It okay. did. I, um, that's actually when I began studying lactose intolerance. Okay. With a great colleague at Minnesota named Mike Levitt, who's actually also still working. Uh, he's in his 70s, and he's uh, at the VA hospital. He's had a long career in, um, in clinical gastroenterology, and we published numerous papers on lactose intolerance. And then as I was promoted to full professor, I went into the dean's office as an associate dean and kept my research program. In fact, those were the years I think I had the most productive, largest research program, a dozen people or so in you know, a large lab. 
and worked on the scholarship programs, the honors programs, built an interdisciplinary major in food retailing with the ag economists. Again, back to that interest in economics and the breadth. Sure. Um, and had three great years there, and early on in those three years, Purdue had a deanship open, and some of my colleagues here who I knew well, Connie Weaver and John Story, were, were trying to get me to apply, and I really wasn't at that point interested. <coughs> Excuse me. But then the position stayed open for a year or so, and in about the second or third year of my deanship there, they came again, and I, I said, okay, I'll look at it. I love small college towns. Davis was a wonderful place to live. West Lafayette's just a wonderful place right. to live. The schools, the, the ease of commute, the, the parks and the recreation, the convocations. Uh, in Minnesota, you know, three million people in the Twin Cities, large, large place. A lot of, a lot of resources there, great theater, great music, but coming back to a small college town was something we wanted to do. So we, we came back in 1995 and uh, the college was really an unpolished gem. Some great faculty, great opportunity. A little bit in trouble, needed, needed, needed some, some opportunity, but that was actually a good thing because I think the faculty were, were willing to grow and change. And so we, we started working on uh, changing the student body a bit, trying to increase the number of high ability students. We moved scholarship support to them for four year awards of multiple thousands of dollars and went out fundraising for that and, and that was very successful. We, I think we increased the SAT scores over a hundred points in ten years and also increased the enrollment from about 1,400 to 1,900 undergraduates and hired a lot of faculty. Uh, a lot of faculty who really were excited about coming to Purdue. You know, its reputation, its opportunity and we're able to build research programs. You know, the, the old home economics issues, which one can call them, you know, human sciences, human ecology, family sciences, consumer and family sciences, are really still critical to society. Uh, money management, teaching people to manage their money, right. uh, child development, gerontology, certainly. We grew a number of initiatives in gerontology in the last 15 years. Uh, certainly nutrition and health has taken on huge um, potentials for savings in health care. Right. And the service economy, which up until this recession was really the economy, uh, selling and sales, retail, hospitality economy, were, are very important. To, to, in fact, they're what we've seen go down in this, in this recession in the 2000, you know, 2008, uh, 9. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. And so we really were positioned to be able to be very successful. Uh, hired some wonderful faculty who grew the research funding in the college to the point where it actually exceeded the research funding in any other unit on a per faculty basis, which was amazing. Yeah. Um, little talk, competitiveness in that, that model. Let me interrupt. Talk a little bit about how you continue with your research at the same time and then we'll move back into the fundraising. Well, I things. became a hobby researcher. Uh, wrote a few grants, wrote a grant with Carol Boucher, a very nice grant on um, uh, calcium and bone development in adolescent girls. We were able to bring about four million dollars from the USDA to Purdue and do a, a, a six-state study uh, with young girls and looking at their calcium intakes and their bone development and the way they drank or avoided milk. And actually published a wonderful paper in Journal of Pediatrics showing that it wasn't whether or not they were lactose maldigesters that was the issue. It was whether they thought they were, were and avoided milk. And if they avoided milk, they had lower bone densities, even at the age of 10 or 11, before they went through puberty. And of course, that will set them up for osteoporosis and a whole set of problems. Down the road. Down the road. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. It's fall cold season with all the students back on campus. <laughs> But the, the research has been slow, but that's okay. Being sure. dean was the first job, and right. the research was... We did a wonderful study with African-American girls showing that they could tolerate you know, significant amounts of dairy foods in their diet without symptoms uh, if you fed it to them with meals. Right. And we monitored their maldigestion over time, and actually the, 
it, consistent with some of our earlier papers, the more the more you can in, keep their dairy foods in their diet, the more tolerant they become. What happens is their large bowel bacteria adapt, and so that uh, they basically the, the large intestine takes over for the small intestine in terms of making them lactose tolerant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, talk about diversity, and there was an increase in, in some of the programs for the male students in some of them in the school where you were there. Yes. Uh, these issues are, are societal issues, and I think more and more as, as women and men move across the workforce and move across opportunities, my oldest daughter is a chem he, uh, you know, and, and was actually surprised because Purdue has a very fine women in engineering program. But when mm -hmm. she went into the workplace, she found herself, you know, in a minority. I think it's true for men in hospitality or in uh, child development as well, or even in dietetics, where at, at universities we're very aggressive about sure. neutralizing the gender opportunities for, for, for people in, in all directions. And yet when folks go into the workplace, they find the workplace is a little different. But we've had great success bringing men to dietetics, to hospitality, to child development. Certainly selling and sales is, is an area. Uh, we, I think we've doubled the Hispanic enrollments in our college. And, you know, the, Indiana is really becoming a more diverse environment. Uh, the Hispanic influx is, is significant. It's important. We at the university are, are committed to helping all students achieve. And, so I'm proud of that as well. Yeah, very. Let's talk about the plant the campaign. Talk about some fundraising, uh, some things that came out of that, which is good. <clears throat> well, I was fortunate when I first came to have an absolutely wonderful development director named Cheryl Altenkimmer. Cheryl went on to be a, a vice president for development here at Purdue. Was she already on board when you she came? She was on board when I came. Okay. So she trained me. I had a very, very fine person to, to help train me. And, and together we did fabulous work. Um, the first significant thing we did was raise a million dollars a year. We, we, I think we hit our first million this second or third year that I was here. Of course, she was on the way to doing that, and I jumped in to help her. Um, and a lot of that was for scholarships. We really worked hard with our donors who love students, who love Purdue students and want them to be successful, to, to fund four-year scholarships of, of significant amounts of money so students can afford to come to Purdue. Sure, right. Good students and who take, can take advantage. advantage of what Purdue had. Exactly. So that was, that was step one, and that built a real good base of, of supporters. You know, they were giving $2,000 a year, $5,000 a year, $10,000 a year, somewhere in endowments. We also received a wonderful will bequest. It's a great example of the power of giving. It was a half a million dollars. And we really needed to up the quality of our faculty at that point in time. So I was able to take the half a million and go to central administration and say, you know, we really need to do something special. We can enhance our faculty quality, our ability to get research grants, our ability to do research. And they matched it really two to one. They matched it with uh, a new laboratories, which back then cost over half a million, and some additional uh, support for startup. So we were able to bring two really outstanding faculty to Purdue, uh, Wayne Campbell and, and Jim Fleet. And the way we developed our faculty is we really would build on who was here who was really outstanding. For example, in child development, Doug Powell and Karen Diamond have really been outstanding. So faculty will come and work with them because they want to be with these outstanding faculty. Right. In nutrition, it was Connie Weaver. And then with Connie, we brought in uh, Jim Fleet, or not Jim Fleet, um, Rick Mattis the year I came. And then Rick Mattis and Connie Weaver allowed us to bring in Jim Fleet and Wayne Campbell, who then allowed us to bring in Carol Boucher, and you can see where this goes. Sure, right. you, can, you start with quality and you keep building quality on your faculty. We did it in every department. Uh, and, you know, Purdue's a great place to raise a family. The cost of living here is low. Our salary structure, although not extremely generous, has good, good benefits. Right. And uh, because the cost of living is low and the schools are excellent, you really can attract people. That's right. right. Um, and, and you're still to close to the big cities if you want to go to right. Chicago or Indianapolis. Right. So you're in between. Sorry. We could use a high-speed train. That's right. I'm interested to see in future years if folks who look at this <laughs> tape, if there's a high-speed train between right. Chicago and West Lafayette and Indianapolis. That yeah. would help us tremendously sure. with spousal issues and right. transportation issues. Um, but back to development, back to fundraising. Yeah, right. So what the second the big, big thing we did was we instituted a planned giving campaign. 
We started it about three years before Martin Jiski came. It's about 97, 96. And actually, we had to argue with the university a little bit that this was a good idea. But it really was. We raised $15 million in planned gifts. We had a number of donors who were elderly who didn't necessarily want to give us cash at the time, but wanted to set up their, their estates so that Purdue and Consumer and Family Sciences could benefit. And those dollars, as they've come in over the years, have really helped us with scholarships, with faculty startups, with space and renovation mm -hmm. issues. The, the timing of that was really good because we got out in front of the per campaign for Purdue. The downside was because we were out in front, it took us a longer time to get going on the campaign for Purdue. Concurrent with that, we had done a space plan. And we have a wonderful building in stone that was built in the 1950s that needed a lot of renovation. It still needs a lot of renovation in 2010. Matthews, which was built in the 20s, yeah, right. uh, which also needs a lot of renovation. Fowler, which was renovated in the early 90s. It's actually the best space we've, we have in the college or the time. And then an old building called Child Development and Family Studies, which really was never designed to be an academic building. It was designed to be a Purdue Village. Because um, it's in that general area. Right. It's been out, yeah. Um, meeting room. Right. <coughs> so as we looked at our space planning, we felt that we could really do something in the human development area. And there were donors and there was opportunity and there was a real need. We could also really do something in the hospitality area, and the hospitality faculty were very excited about building something that would be for them, that would be a, a, a gem, an icon for hospitality management. The, the consumer science faculty in Matthews were quite pleased with their space, but needed more of it. And of course, if we could build other space, they could, they could have more. And it's a wonderful location for building. And nutrition was a challenge because the laboratories are so expensive. Uh, we estimated it'd be about $40 million to, yeah. est to replace foods and nutrition labs, and that was undoable in terms of fundraising. So uh, the result of that was we decided to try to build two new buildings, uh, a human development institute and a hospitality management building. And it's September 21st, 2010, and both buildings are under construction. Hanley Hall, thanks to Bill and Sally Hanley, and Ben and Maxine Miller, and Linda Rohrman and a number of other people will be constructed and in, in, done in March. It's a wonderful space right next to Fowler on, on State Street. The architecture really turned out beautifully. It's three stories. It'll include the uh, Military Family Research Institute, which the Lilly Endowment helped support. And actually, I should thank them for space too because they also paid for part of the building. And it'll include the gerontology uh, research program, the CALC, Right. A Center for Aging and the Life Course. And the, the Hanleys are very committed to gerontology. And it's attached by a bridge to Fowler, so the department will all be in one contiguous space. I was going to ask you, that's how the, it'll right. be linked. Okay. In fact, the second floor of Hanley leads right into, the, uh, f in, into Fowler where all the faculty offices are. So it's, it'll really be a great opportunity for child development and family studies and for the university. Sure. And it's a good, handy location. It's a good, nice location, too. It is. New child care facilities. Uh, the child development labs will be moving across the street in the back of Hanley, and they'll share the playground area with the Miller Learning Center. So it really turned out to be a beautiful building. Marriott Hall should be done in July of 2011. Uh, the Marriott families also is very generous, along with a number of, of other donors, uh, Day Dots, uh, um, Echo Labs, uh, and others. That building's on the corner of State and University, right across from Matthews. It's a very modern looking building for Purdue, a lot of glass, very close to the street, but glass at a restaurant, in fact, two restaurants right up near the street. And it'll be a great home for hospitality and tourism management, which has had two number one rankings in the United States in the last 10 years, in the only two rankings that have been done. Uh, great faculty, they love their students, and that building will really allow them to grow and prosper. How was it, uh, was it difficult finding a space? Uh, you know, Purdue's very lucky. We, we have a lot of land. Because it's, it's close to right. where, where you are now. I think, you know, there's been a lot of great planning at Purdue with regard to land and space. Right. And, and in fact, the last few years we've gone through another iteration of the, of the, the campus plan. 
So I think there's well thought out use of space and there's, there's a lot of future planning for, for where buildings might go. So we were very fortunate. We actually had choices as to where the building might, buildings mm -hmm. might go. Mm -hmm. But I think they're both at ideal locations. Right. That's coming along pretty quickly because you're, it's going to be open ne next yeah. year, isn't it? Yeah, That's really, are. really moving along with that. Yeah, the construction, you know, the good thing about a recession is construct, uh, building companies want to build and they're willing to jump in and get it done. Right, so. Exactly. Uh, um, then well, let's talk about the uh, two other items, the Center for Families and the Inspiring Families, those two okay. things. And they come along the road with the Well, the Center for Families actually had started prior to my arrival. Um, Lorraine Burkhart, one of our donors, had been instrumental in helping start the Center for Families with um, some faculty in, in child development and family studies. Susan Contos, who, who passed away a few years ago, was really the, the founding director. The idea was to bring a land-grant perspective to family issues, to bring a, an integration of research, teaching, and outreach, and to, to really not isolate those issues, but to integrate them so that the center would work on policy issues, it would work on uh, engaging Indiana and Indiana's families. It would also work on uh, instruction education, particularly for graduate students, and it would, it would support research. Uh, Shelley McDermott has, has run that center for the last few years and has done a wonderful job. Uh, but it's really been a very visible way that, that donors, alumni, Purdue, can impact the, the quality of life of families in Indiana right. and beyond. And of course, Shelley's taken that and gone toward military families. Right. With the, the wars recently in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, that's become an incredibly important issue. And these wars were the first wars America's fought primarily with a guard and reserve as opposed right. to a, a regular army, right. which makes the support for family issues very difficult. Uh, you know, in the old the old days, the old wars, military families tended to live in military communities. Being a Southern California, you know, we had Camp Pendleton and uh, the Navy base in San Diego, and Long Beach had a Navy base that was gone now, and Fort Ord, and so forth. And families lived there, and they had their schools and their churches and their support systems. Sure. But when Guard and Reserve are involved in fighting a war, they're your and my next door neighbor, and we don't know what they're going through. We don't know what their families are going through. And their, their ministers and their, their counselors and their teachers don't know what they're going through. So it makes it much more difficult to support families. And so Shelley really took that, that issue on. We also started a wonderful um, advisory group that helps the legislature understand family issues. Every year we do a, a, a seminar for the legislature. It's their topic. They, the legislature chooses the topic. And we go down and work with others in the state to bring experts to that topic. And it had a real impact on the state. Uh, I would think so. All Day Kindergarten, for example, probably came directly out of our, our seminars on the value of All Day Kindergarten in, in uh, providing education for children and getting them off to a good start. Uh, a number of issues like that where we've raised those issues in the research awareness. Not suggesting a specific policy, but providing information, sure. which then allows the legislature to do their job to develop policy that helps, right. you know, move Giving them a forward. look and a view of it. Exactly. Right. The uh, Inspiring Families and Building Communities Award actually began with a donor as well. Um, Paul Zamolo came into my office one day. His wife was an extension educator, and she had passed away quite a few years before Paul. Paul just recently passed away. Um, but Paul came in and said, you know, Dennis, uh, we really don't celebrate what goes on in Indiana very effectively in terms of families and communities. Shouldn't Purdue take a leading role? And I said, it should. Would you like to support it? And he said, yes, I would. So he put up a little bit of money, and we put some faculty together thinking about what we might do, and we came up with the idea of an Inspiring Families Building Communities Award. And we really focused around issues of connecting family members, parents, children, grandparents, children, programs that build family connections and support those family connections. You know, we do a lot of wonderful things for, for people. We have early childhood programs. 
We have elder care programs. But what we were most interested in was supporting programs that, that connected and supported family interaction. Yeah. Correct. So we've been able annually to award to two or three different organizations all around the state uh, small amounts of money, a few hundred dollars. But it's really the publicity and the recognition that's important to these organizations. Uh, it makes a huge difference in the way they're perceived in their communities. Uh, it makes a huge difference in the way they're perceived by their funders. If they can put on their resume that they're, they're a recipient of a, of a statewide award and that Purdue has acknowledged them. It provides a lot of credibility, a lot of support, and a lot of help. And we've built some great relationships that way as well. What's the reaction to the families when they find out that they're the winners? What sort of? Well, the organizations are delighted. Sure. You know, I mean, they're, they're just delighted. And typically, they'll bring their, their clients together, and they'll celebrate this. They'll bring the newspapers. And we try to make a fairly big deal out of the award. Yeah. So we, we want the newspapers there, the television, uh, sure. radio, if possible, and a lot of their, their clients, the families. You know, we've given awards to, to organizations that support children with special needs by bringing their families to understand those issues. Uh, we've supported after-school programs that are not simply after-school programs, but bring families together sure. to support the after-school initiative. We gave an award one year to the high school at Richmond where they have an outstanding program to support teen mothers. But it's not simply that they're, they're taking care of the, the infants that, about the teen mothers. It's the volunteers that come in and help these teen mothers connect with their children to become mothers. And so it goes way beyond simply childcare to providing support for, for the mothers. Um, that's a lot of great needed. examples. Yeah, that's really good. And really that's what Purdue should be doing. What, right. what land-grant universities need to do is go out and support, celebrate, help, assist. You know, we're not there to solve everyone's problems. We're here to help people solve their own Give problems. Give them some support and, and work with them. <coughs> exactly. I think this is true. That's true, too. Um, one thing I thought the researchers might be interested in, you have Consumer and Family Science Program for the Cooperative Extension Service. Just make a comment how they tie, how you tie in. You have extension people within the school. Is that how We do works? have faculty okay. uh, in the college and, okay. and, and uh, educators in the college who support the counties, particularly around issues of personal finance and financial management, uh -huh. nutrition and health, and human development. Those are the three areas actually in the land-grant acts right. that specifically relate to the programs in consumer and family sciences. Right. Uh, Eve Goebel, I think, former dean, third dean of the college, I believe, uh, was, the, was instrumental in setting up this, this wonderful partnership with agriculture, where we, we are really in, in, in uh, collaboration with the College of Agriculture to, to support what's going on in the counties. Right. Now we've, we've actually built on that further. Uh, recently we received a large grant with the IU Medical School for Health, the Clinical and Tran Translational Sciences Institute, and that's trying to bring the health initiative to extension. To the communities. The to the local, communities. The local level. So that we become the avenue, extension becomes the avenue by which the medical profession can provide medical education in the counties. So if we can pull that off, if we can, we can develop that model for extension, it's a whole new opportunity for right. extension. Right. Uh, extension historically has had a youth development, 4-H, a consumer family sciences, a production, agriculture, and an, and an economic development emphasis, those four areas. Adding health as a fifth area would be a wonderful addition to extension. All right, and it fits in with the others too as well. It just it does. would be very nice. Yeah. And in fact, the new structure of the college, Health and Human Sciences, fits very well in that regard. Right, exactly. Good point. Um, you did, still doing some consulting? You've been doing that? I am. Uh, okay, that's yeah. good. Um, the uh, big anniversary the seven, that you had, you want to make a couple comments on that? The anniversary was... The 75th anniversary right. of the college was a wonderful opportunity to, to celebrate donors, alumni, faculty, and others. It also tied exactly with the end of our planned giving campaign. Exactly. Good point. So we were able to celebrate the success of a $15 million planned giving campaign along with the contributions of a lot of wonderful people. We had 75 hidden diamonds that we had, we had celebrated. We put together a wonderful 
history of the college by, by um, decade and, and, and spent a lot of time talking about where we'd come from and where we were going. So it was a great opportunity to sort of pause and reflect and plan. Isn't it nice when you put together those timelines and things, you, you sort of look back and you had no idea what really went on before and it pulls it all together. And it's just, you know, I think timelines are great. Having Actually produce history in regard to home economics, consumer and family science, now health and human sciences is, is a phenomenal story. It there. Is. Some and they don't realize when it got started and how long ago it yeah. was. <coughs> and the, the challenges to get it going because not everyone was in favor of, of women on the Purdue campus or programs aimed to support women. Mm -hmm. And it really took some political efforts. Right. Um, A lot of work went into that, which people don't realize. <laughs> even took some devious, well, modestly <laughs> devious. You know, the Dean of Agriculture went around the president to the legislature with Virginia Meredith to help start our school. And the result of that is that the president ended up putting the school in the College of Science as a punishment to the Union of Agriculture. Little unknown story that, that <laughs> I think... Um, that surface you find out about, right, yeah. yeah. Um, the Foods and Nutrition Hall of Fame, one of your awards. That's very nice. Congratulations. Thank you. Yes. Any others that, uh, awards that you'd like to come in on? Have come down? Oh, gosh. The one that comes to mind? I'm not a real... You okay. Know, th th uh, that's fine. You've uh, been... It's very, uh, very nice. I think Foods and Nutrition has built such a wonderful faculty. We've been, Connie Weaver and I had so much fun hiring the Wayne Campbells and the Carol Boucher's and the um, Jim Fleets and uh, Dorothy Teagard's career has, has gone in such a positive direction. The quality of faculty is really what makes a university. And you know, these faculty are amazing because firstly, they're outstanding teachers. They love students. They love undergraduate students and graduate students. And they're also internationally re renowned researchers. And in fact, I'd argue with you that that's what makes a land-grant university great, is faculty who can and want to both teach and do research and outreach. Uh, Carol Boucher is now our, our lead outreacher in the Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute. So she's out working with the medical community in the counties to, to bring medical education through extension to the counties. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity. Sure is. All right, exactly, good point. The uh, couple of your associations, the Association of Public and Land-Grant Universities, you've been on the Human Sciences Executive Committee. Are you still going to continue to serve on that? No, I'm stepping oh. off in November. Okay. I'm okay. kind of bringing that phase to an end. We had a, a good run there. We, we changed that organization substantially. It was, uh, it was burdened by too many committees, uh, too large a group of uh, folks who were supposed to be doing. We, we brought it down to a nine-member executive board changed its bylaws, hired a professional executive director, and have been very successful in, in rebuilding the membership and the organization. It's really important for the country. Uh, these programs around the country have been very successful, like Purdue's. All right. You know, we can make a list of others that have, have seen growth and opportunity. Uh, Penn State, Ohio State, um, Nebraska, Iowa State, Kansas State, Georgia, Florida State. Um, I mean, the list goes on. A number have been very successful, and uh, these organizations together have a lot of opportunity. Right. right. Okay. Uh, got a favorite Purdue tradition? Oh, I think I love the music. Okay. I think I love the, the, the band and the, the orchestra and the, the traditional songs of Purdue. Um, that and graduation. It's always wonderful to shake students' hands. I second that. There are many <coughs> others that I've interviewed who it just takes their breath, it takes them away when they're up there, and it's it's a wonderful tradition that they continue to maintain it, and it's in all. We its power. conduct graduation in ways that is just very right. great. It's wonderful for students. It is, and the traditions, but also some of the newer things. And yeah, good point. How about an outstanding event? Come to mind? Oh Anything? gosh! Oh, I'm sure you got. We can have homecoming. More than one. Huh? <laughs> you, know, you know, homecoming is a, is a wonderful event. Let me tell you the story about the way homecoming evolved during these years. When I first came, we had a wonderful tent, and we had a lot of alums that would come to visit. At Stone Hall? Is that where you No, had? we actually had it over by Mackey. Okay. Actually, there's a building being built on where our tent used to be right now. <laughs> I, um, I drive by it every yeah. day. 
Uh, and we had lots of alums come back and a lot of faculty. The faculty would, get, would come back and meet with the alums. And there wasn't a student anywhere. You couldn't find a student. So we started by building a student council event that included a silent auction. Which, and then we brought our student ambassadors, which we'd also developed. So now we had 60 or 70 students there, either selling something. I own a lot of things that no one else wanted to buy over the last 15 years, but that's okay. Um, or just greeting alums. And this was a very successful model. In fact, when Murray Blackwelder came, we talked about Purdue's homecoming. And I think one of the proudest things is that Murray adopted our model for the university. So we built a tent city on the engineering mall. Our tent is still there every year. And kind of built the same model. A lot of student involvement, a lot of student activities, a lot of showcasing what we do at Purdue, um, food. And so... And a big turnout. And a big turnout, a right. huge turnout, thousands and thousands. Right, exactly. And so I think we've really built a, a wonderful homecoming that is, I think, much more able to reflect to the, to the alumni and to the community at large what Purdue does. All right, exactly. And right. There's, it's just great interaction, and it, as long as the weather's great, you just have a lot of, and there are a lot of things going on at the same time that you're out there with the, in the tents. And I think the key is you bring students, faculty, and alumni together. Right, yeah. And, and you know, that's not hard to do if you, you plan your events correctly. That's right, and that's the planning is the big thing. And uh, you want to tell us about, a little bit about your new position? Well, I moved into the provost's office. Uh, Randy Woodson, our, our former provost, asked me what I really wanted to work on. Where was my heart? And as I looked at the, our current strategic plan and the opportunity, Purdue is a wonderful set of colleges. And you know, I've had three children now go through Purdue. So I've watched this from a number of perspectives and thousands and thousands of students. But sometimes these wonderful colleges haven't been as flexible or as supportive of students that they needed to move across colleges. For example, we teach way too many forms of calculus at Purdue today. The Dean of Science is actually going to fix this in the next year or two. Uh, so that they don't always apply to all the majors. It makes it a, a barrier sometimes for students. Plus, we've not necessarily provided enough opportunities for outstanding students at Purdue. Purdue is a tremendous resource for the state and the nation. And we owe it to ourselves to bring students to Purdue who can really benefit from that resource. Mm -hmm. So I talked to the provost about working on honors and undergraduate studies and student access and success programs, which is really kind of core to the strategic plan in terms mm -hmm. of the way the university is structured. So actually this week we're naming a task force that I'll chair that will look at the structures of honors, undergraduate studies, and, and student access and success programs and propose new structures. A number of universities have honors colleges right. or university colleges that are designed to support the first year experience or designed to support honors, designed to support students who might design their own majors or support their transfer from one unit to another. And so I'm excited about what we can do for Purdue students. Because you know, the world is a very interdisciplinary place today. The, we just had an incredibly awful oil spill in the Gulf. And you know, that, that oil spill was a good example of the interaction of, of disciplines in a way. It, yes, it was a technological problem. And it was an engineering problem. But it was also biological, right. a biological disaster. And a human. And, and a human, human problem, right. uh, you know, and a political problem for our president. And an economic problem for millions of people in the Gulf and beyond. Right. And so our students really need to understand and appreciate the interdisciplinarity of issues. And an undergraduate college and an honors college can help do that. So I'm really excited about helping change the face of Purdue again. I don't know where it's going to go. We're just starting to have the conversation. But we'll have the conversation in the next six months and hopefully come up with a strategy and a model that will, will be helpful for students. Good. Sounds good. And closing, if there's something, some sheet that I forgot to, or any question I forgot to ask, I'm going to leave it in your hands. Or some look-aheads or whatever. Purdue is an incredibly unique place in the beginning of the 21st century. It's a place that loves its students, loves its state, 
and loves its potential to make a difference for the world through its research and its outreach. It's a very modest place. It's not egotistical. It's not arrogant. It doesn't believe it's bigger than it is. It continues to try to achieve, to achieve great things, to make great progress, to make great students, to make great research findings. And it's been, it's been a real pleasure to come here and be a part of that. Uh, it's been a privilege, an honor. And to continue to give back, right. Oh, without question. I'm, sure. you know, not, not done yet. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dennis. I really appreciate this. It's my privilege. Thank you. Thank you. you. <clears throat>